All right, in this video, I'm going to attempt to show you what I did to do the three coolant loops inside my first generation Chevy Volt. Uh, I hope that the times when you watch this video, you're doing a lot better and that COVID's beyond us. It's the last night of the 45th president and tomorrow's going to be the 46th president's first time. So I wish the best to them both and I wish the best to America as a whole. Uh, please, not a political thing, but please wear a mask and respect others because this is what we need to do to uh, get beyond this and you know, to save more lives and keep America, you know, just keep America on the right path to doing good things. So besides that, hopefully this video will inspire you to uh, try to do this yourself or maybe make another video for some other mechanic or other thing that helps uh, other people out there. So uh, a little bit about this procedure. It's uh, pretty involved. There's three different coolant loops. On uh, the video, I'm going to take you through all three of them. The first one is going to be the electronics loop, and to get that you have to go to the left side of the car wheel well and go through there. That's the easiest of the loops. The second loop is the battery loop. That's the one that's the medium difficulty, but it's the one if you screw it up, it'll, you can get the uh, high voltage won't charge uh, error that's pretty common. And that's the one you need the uh, battery purge procedure for. The third loop is the uh, engine side, the internal combustion engine side. And that one's just kind of particular and you got to run the engine off and on and open up the valves. So I just take you to the easiest one, the medium one, the hard one. And the last two are going to be on the right side of the vehicle and you're going to go through the uh, wheel well on there. It's pretty involved. I'd say that uh, if, you, if you take it in and the, the dealership's charging you 400, 500 bucks, it's, it's actually the mechanic working his time on that. And they're not, it's not one that they can undercut the rate on. Uh, if I was going to be a shade tree mechanic, I'd probably charge 300 for the loops. And that's, of course, you know, you know that's like, like with no, none of the guarantees or the, or the stuff in the shop that actually charges. It took me probably about four and a half hours to do. I could probably do it again in about three and a half hours. And maybe if I got better, I'd get another rate. Yeah, the proper tools, of course, you know, and the actual jack stand would be a little bit better. I was only able to get out of about uh, two and three fourths of a gallon. Yeah, two and three fourths of a gallon of uh, of coolant outside the three loops. It's I think it holds about four gallons total. I have to read it. I think it's just shy of that. So it's you know it's around like seventy percent. So anywhere from sixty five to seventy five percent of the coolant in there. So I plan to do this again in five years. And after that, I don't think I'm going to have the car in ten years. So who knows? Uh, the only other thing I'm going to add is that it's pretty tough. Uh, you know, make sure that your car is on a level location. Make sure you give yourself extra time and make sure you buy three gallons of the coolant and that you have another means of doing it and watch the video through its entirety before you decide to do it. Also, disclaimer, you know, this is all on you. I'm not responsible for anything. This is just my advice, advising you on what I did and not telling you what to do. Uh, the only other thing to add is uh, I used the the battery charger that was for lead acid batteries and not for AGM, which on my eight year old battery finally killed it. I was getting the, uh, the weird things you have a volt, and the battery goes, you end up all these weird errors, and the computers are dying. And it's essentially, it's eight years on an AGM, which is, you know, about average or pretty good. But it was, it was a, I think I ended up killing it a little earlier. Maybe we got an extra year or two out of it. But, you know, it just means that now something else that won't break down on the car for a while when I had to get a new one. So I hope this uh, video finds you in a much better time than currently is now, and uh, hopefully everything's good. So I'm going to go through the three loops, and uh, hope you have a good one.
These are all the items that I've used for the three coolant loops. The first is the fluid itself. This is the pre-mixed AC Delco 5050. This is the part number right there, 125027. This is the pre-mix. Uh, if you're going to get the concentrate, you have to use the ionized, not the sealed. So it's much easier just to do this, and you need three gallons, is what I used. I used about two and three-fourths, or right around that time, that amount. Uh, to catch the fluid, we end up doing a, end up building, this is a cardboard box with a plastic garbage bag. It worked pretty well. Uh, originally, I was going to use a bucket and some other stuff, but they're too high. So make sure you measure the right size of the height. You do. To lift the vehicle and remove the, uh, the tires, I ended up using this right here. You can see I have, I have a scissor lift right there. That's what I do to get to the first one. Then I would put in the uh, jack stands and then the jack lift for when I went up and down when I was adjusting the height so I could try to get more fluid out. And then of course you have you know, your lug nut wrench. I think it's a 19. And then I have a 19 and I have a torque wrench set to 95. I think it's Newton meters, and you have to check those torques back on that. So, just a, this is good to have, and also chalk blocks just for safety purposes. Uh, moving on, this is what I used for the vacuum to create the vacuum uh, here. So, I needed my shop air. That's when I ran it around at 80 psi, and then I'd run it. Here's the kit that I bought. Uh, let me see, I bought it off of Amazon. It's coolant system, vacuum fuel, ABN. They also sell it on that website. They're pretty common. I think it cost me about 30. I also use splicing tape around the seals in the uh, battery and the electronics loops, uh, if you see in the video. And then I have here some various tools that I use throughout. This right here is for the hose, hose clamps right here. It's a hose clamp wrench. It was pretty useful. Um, I also used a pair of pliers. I used uh, this is one of the uh, edge tools. I used it to get off one of the some of the battery or not the batteries, the quick disconnects uh, plastic pieces when I was taking off the liners. I also used the flathead. I used this is ten, eight, and seven uh, millimeters. And I had two torque styles that I used the T17 is for the wheel wells and a T30 in case you want to remove the uh, it's the resonator to get to, to get uh, into the uh, coolant tank and remove that it made it a little easier to do that uh, for this is what I use instead of the the vacuum uh, pump they used I used the transfer pump and I stuck this down you'll see it in the video this is the cheap Harbor Freight eight dollar special it worked pretty well. Uh, right here, this is safety and cleanup right here. And I always have paper towels, uh, you know, or gloves. Stuff's not that good. Safety glasses are really important. You're going to be crawling underneath. Don't get stuff in your eyes. Goop's always good stuff to clean up. If you want something else, some kitty litter, if you have that, is pretty good stuff or another absorbent. Uh, the stuff does not evaporate. If you have children or pets around, it's pretty nasty. So you don't want them to expose to it. Uh, moving on, the last thing I used was this is a battery charger or a battery tender, and I used the this I used the VCX Nano with my computer to interface uh, and run the purge pumps, and as well as the last steps, last steps for the uh, ice loop, which is just uh, the heater core cycling that so you can get the air out of it. So those are all the parts I used. Hopefully this is helpful. So, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the jack stand now. I'm going to do on the driver's side first. First thing, always chalk the wheels first. That way you have a little more secure. And we're going to go over here and we're going to find the point to do it. If you haven't used a jack stand or a floor jack before, what well, this right here, this is how you press relief on and on. That'll actually allow you to jack it up or it'll release it, release the hydraulic fluid and lower the jack. Uh, do you want to use it slowly? This is not a primer on how to use this, so I'm not going to tell you much. This is uh, how you do it, and you go down, and that'll raise the jack stand point. 
what's critical is that you're going to actually line it up to the right point because not on all your car can support not all the base of the car can support the wheel or the support the full weight of the car or a quarter of it okay so what we're going to do is we're going to find the jack stand point and if you look in here underneath the car right now this black area right here is actually a good spot to use it there's another one on the other side for when you do the passenger side so what we're going to do is we're going to put the floor floor jack in here and make it go up and then we're going to raise it and then we're going to we're going to lower it down but we're going to have the floor jack in there and the floor jack is, is the secure point so i'm going to attempt to do that now when you pull off the wheel you want it to be just above that way it's not free spinning what you want to do right before this is you want to actually start to loosen these the lug nuts right before It'll make it a little easier now that it's a little loose it'll spin around more freely it's just easier to have the weight of the vehicle to help you with that right now we have this those are ready with the pre done that's underneath there on that floor jack and that's the position so let's uh i'll get back to you when i pull off this wheel and then i'll lower the i'll pull off the jack stand we'll lower all the weight on there all right our wheels off and our lug nuts get yourself one of these and make life a lot easier this sort of thing so you don't lose anything and it's going to be better when we start taking off wheel wear well liner stuff so now we're going to lower this onto the, this is in the right position you got to make sure it's in that little this little hole right there light it up so you see it better but it's inside the little cutout area and that it's not it's actually going to hit the uh, there's metal underneath and that's that metal rail the flat portion the flat portion is where you're going to hit so Make sure it's well on that because you don't want this thing to fall and you know you start breaking your part of your vehicle. So right now we're going to end up lowering this down and we're going to do it. We're going to release the hydraulic pressure. You're going to do it slowly. You don't want to crank this thing open. Usually it's good to have two hands on it. That way you can slowly do it instead of just moving it really quick. So lower it. Now here we are good. I'm going to still leave this in place just in case I don't want you should never rely on a floor jack, but floor jack in place, and I also have the jack stand, so I'm going to leave it just for extra peace of mind. All right, so this is going to go in the beginning of the video, and this is I'm going to talk about a little bit of proper jacking. I didn't really do the proper techniques earlier. I used to say it throughout the video, but since I'm going to crawl under soon, I'm going to tell you what to do. So you have uh, the lift points for scissors, and or for your floor jack, and it's underneath here. You'll see it on the unibody. There's a line that goes through. There's a part that's cut out right there in the plastic. You don't go to the flat part. You go on the uh, where the metal is facing down. And uh, either get one of these types of jacks, the scissor jacks that have a slot, or you're going to use one of these. And there's what's called the puck inserts or the line body inserts. I have one ordered, but it hasn't come in yet. So you just have to lift it. But if you're ever going to crawl underneath there, you got to make sure that you have your these floor jacks in here. And sometimes they have floor jacks that are self-lifting. If you have a couple of those, those are nice that lock into place. But it goes around this side of the, you'll see these, and there's four of these underneath here. Let's see if we got, oh, I don't have a light, so sorry. But you'll see there's four of these things in here, and what they are is like the little recessed black area. That's essentially, huh. We're going to start by taking off the components over here. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to use a uh, plug up here and then there's going to be the T15s are going to be under over here and there's going to be a couple of the seven millimeters on the bottom right there. So I'll take them off and be back with you. So a quick up halfway to, through. I've gotten four of these out right there. Those are the two, those are the, sorry, the four uh, T15s, they're pretty easy to come out. Next, I have two of these are the uh, tab offs. I got one up here. So you see it? Not that one right there. It's going to be the one on the left side of it. And I also have the one back here. I have this one I have halfway through. Here's this is the plastic uh, ply bar that I'm using. You got to be careful because this right here is the uh, that's going to be your uh, brake fluid hose. So you want to bend that or hit that or do anything to it. So be careful when you're doing this. What you're going to do is you're going to actually go between. There's two different layers of plastic. I'll show you on this one right here. 
there is a layer of plastic. You see the two rings? I want to go between those two. Uh, try, to, try to see if I can point it out. So just where the shade is touching right now, that's the first layer just on the edge of it. Then I can move over, that's the second one. And so right there, over here, I have the first layer right here, and I popped it up already. And that means that what it does is that underneath it, mechanically, it's released it, the latch that holds it. It's shrunk back to the original size, and it should pop out fairly easily. So let's see if this does or not. Oh, sorry, I accidentally hit the off button. It's kind of hard to do everything one-handed and actually do it at the same time. So I have this. I pulled it back there. came off really easily. Mechanically, that's what it looks like. Let's see where there's more light. If I can focus on it, actually. So you can see right there, they wedge, they form out, and they fill the wedge. And when you pull it back, it's less warm. So save these. These are not magnetic. but still put them in there with everything else. I'm going to do the second one, and then move on. So here we are. This is the front side, driver's side real well. We've just removed the inner over there. And now we're going to remove down underneath. There's five. One, two, three, four, five, seven millimeters. And there's three. One, two, and then underneath here you can't see it. On the far side there's three eight millimeters. And that should be the last of it. And then we should be able to go in here, move the front side forward. We have everything else removed. And we should have then have access to, probably can't see it because it's so dark in there, but yeah, not yet. Well, I see it. We'll have access to the bottom of the pump where we need to disconnect and start the draining. All right, see you in a few. And into, so I came across this and I ran into something weird and I deviated from where the manual tells you to do. So this right here, it says these will come forward. You can pull it forward. I'm going to tell you a procedure, but I tried uh, wedging there, getting in there. You can see this lip right here. There's not so much of a, uh, this, this thing will go in easily. It won't come out easily, but I'm afraid of breaking it. So instead of doing it, I dropped the whole, I dropped the rear of the uh, wheel well uh, fender. And to do that, there was one up here, two, three down here, and four which is, you can see right there's the original hole. There's four of these quick connects. There's also three, one, two, three, uh, T, or the T15 uh, Torx. So those come off, it comes down. You gotta push it back a little bit because it has these two connect, these two little bevels holding it in place. Looks like it was something to do because I had a lot of junk in there too. So just got it out. Uh, since it's out, I'm gonna inspect it to see any damage. I have a thermoplastic repair, uh, Kit like 16 bucks at Harbor Freight. Use it on a couple things. If this is ABS plastic, it'd be perfect. Uh, I suggest you check in a look to see if you have any damage. It's easy to repair, and you know it's one of the things I I spent it on. A, you know, on a, I guess a $300 Audi undercarriage body part. Spent 15 bucks on and use it for a couple things. ABS only. Don't use. Uh, epoxy or anything like that or resins on ABS. It's just thermoplastics, which is, it's at low surface, uh, low surface energy, which means that it won't chemically bond well with other things, but it'll melt and that's what you want to do with that. Well, I'm going to take this out and then we're finally can see down there. I'm going to get to it next. I'm going to drain it. Hopefully the bucket will be able to fit in there. Probably not because it's too big. So I'm going to have to improvise something else. So I'll figure it out. All right. All right. So here we are. Now we have our loop open. We have our uh, access right here. Here's where we're going to disconnect. It's right here, this connection, and this is going to drain the whole, this whole loop. And this is the electronic loop side. Uh, I had a little bit of an impasse. This was not uh, low enough, the lip of this, to fit underneath there. So what I ended up doing, I ended up taking a garbage bag and you can take a garbage bag. You got to make sure it's sealed. Don't use the little cheapy uh, like Walmart bags or something unless you know that it'll hold water. And then you form it with, in this case, a cardboard box. I know this cardboard box is three gallons because three of the AC Delco, uh, the premix came in here. So I'm gonna able to disconnect that. I'm gonna use my tool over there. It was a lot easier to get to, so I could probably use a uh, pair of pliers to do it, but I already have the tool, it's 15 bucks. It's, I still think it's worth it. 
So I'm gonna do that, and this is the point of no return. So once I'm gonna undo this right here, I'm gonna then open up that loop and it'll drain it. I wanna do this first before, or, do, or undo this loop down here before I do this. Those has got like back pressure. That's because it won't rush out nearly as quick, so I can at least control it a little better. So I'm gonna connect it. I wanna just, you know, always safety first. Don't keep any of yourself on the body. Don't put your head into the wheel well if you can avoid it. That's probably why this tool, or one of the many reasons why this tool is better than sticking your head in. Uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna have these right here are catches right here. And when you squeeze it, it's gonna pull on it. This one's fully engaged, so I gotta open it up. And I'm gonna do it. There's two clips on here. On this side, you squeeze it. You squeeze them together. This opens up so that it's not putting pressure. The collar's not putting pressure on the tube. And then you're gonna move it back off, and you're gonna pull it off. Once you pull it off, it's a point of no return. And open it up, and it'll do it. So we'll see how it goes. So one thing I wanna demonstrate are the quick release tabs for these hose clamps right here. So this hose clamp on the bottom, I'm putting this back together. It, uh, it's locked into position, it's got a quick release. Uh, you don't want your fingers around there when you're doing this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push the tab down on the bottom, see if I can get a better picture for you. Underneath, it's hard to do that, everything one-handed. Probably the... All right, so you can see underneath there's a little tab right here. And this is that tab that's sticking up that's keeping this, it's under tension. So I push this down, it should lock. This one's kind of a pain, huh? And the problem with them is that they, if you release the tension, it springs rather uh, quickly. So this one I might actually have to, another method I've done with this is I have I've actually pushed down on this with the simultaneously relieving the tension on here. I have it. I'm not gonna be able to show you how to do this. This is what it looks like when it's on. Uh, it's hard to do it one-handed by holding this. But essentially what I did is you see there's this little tab in here. When these things are engaged, when you squeeze them together, what they end up doing is they ended up, end up getting stuck on this. And so it makes it easy to move off and on. But when you need to relieve it, what you do is you squeeze it and get the squeeze. This one's already got the top one in otherwise. Do it. You squeeze them both together with a tab, even though it's already caught by the tab, and then you push down with the screwdriver. So this metal piece right here would actually be on the other side of this tab that's sticking up right here. So you squeeze them together with the other hand, you push down on this, and then you slowly let go of your pair of pliers, and that will relieve it. Uh, if you push down on this, sometimes it's too much tension for it to come off. Other times it'll spring. You don't want your fingers around when you're doing this. So there's a bunch of these throughout the vehicle. So this is just something look for it. All right, so just an update. I got the collar off right there. That was pretty hard to do, and I did whack myself. The thing popped up under tension, and the collar uh, hit my finger. Luckily, I'm wearing a glove. Otherwise, it still stings, but it would have hurt a lot more. Please wear gloves during this time or some sort of protection. This is the finger right here, and it doesn't feel, it feels a little tingly, but nothing broken. What I did with this, sorry, it's going to be hard to do this with the uh, one-handed again, but what I did is I have it, so I have the tensioner under here. You could probably do it from underneath it. And then what I did is I, uh, you can see kind of right here, it's pretty indented right there. So much tension it's under. What I did is I got through the middle and I wedged it a little bit more. I went to the back, pulled on it, spun it around. Actually, if it's wet, now what happened when it initially got a little bit wet and that made this thing get a lot smoother. So I guess it reduces the friction right there. So having pouring a little bit of water on it might make it uh, go a little bit easier. So I guess alternatively what you could do is I started to disconnect it but then I went back to this is you could probably disconnect here the white part. There's a white tab that pulls back on the connection but then you have to drop this out and you can play with this down here. Uh, it's probably a little bit difficult so I'm about to pop this off now so totally point of no return. See you in a bit. All right, here we are. That's loose on top. And... Let's see if we get some light in there. And there it goes. So it should drain this loop right here. And then I'm gonna start the vacuum feel after that.
All right, so the hose is disconnected. All the fluids in there. Looks like I got the three, I think it's three liters in there, I wanna say. Looks like it's about right. And this is empty over here. So, time to reattach everything. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reconnect that over there. Make sure it's on and make sure you have the uh, band over top of the uh, feed lip right there. And then you're gonna put it on the same reverse order. You put it, took it off. So attach the five there, the three eights, uh, attach the four up here and the clips back here. And don't forget these three right here. So next I will do, we'll be giving you a primer how to use the vacuum fill on a different thing. And when putting back on the wheel well cowling, I suggest you do the metal pieces first, but only do them in part way so that they're just holding it in, but not tight enough so that they actually fix it in a certain orientation. Once you get those in there and you get the back ones in there, then put the plastic pieces in. Uh, make sure that this is on the outside, that the inside well lip goes inside here. And another suggestion is that when you line them up, remove the plastic piece they split in two, and then put the first piece in, and then put the second piece in afterwards. If you put them in together, I broke a couple of bits off of one of them. So it held in with the, the two bits remaining, but it's something that, you know, if you break the next two and the next one, you don't want to do that. So throw in the wheel and then to the vacuum. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention torque specs. Uh, there's torque specs for the ones here and here. I think it's three Newton meters. You have to go look it up yourself. I just do it hand tight for these right here. I've done a lot of these before. I take the less dominant hand and I use three fingers and when I rotate them, I get to where they're finger tight. Not where I'm cranking it all the way, but enough to feel that it's tight. If you over tighten some of these, they'll actually break the thread. Under tighten, they'll come off, but if you just make them snug, it should be okay. The wheel's back on. I'm actually gonna use a torque wrench on it. Torque wrist essentials. Uh, if you look at these, this is a clicker type, which means that it you rotate it until it clicks over once you have a pre-selected uh, torque spec. Usually uh, 95 foot, or not foot pounds, 90, or sorry, it is foot pounds. 95 foot pounds is usually what you want to set it around for the lug nuts. When you do your lug nuts, you want to do them in a star. So you put them on, you just put them on just kind of hand tight with this and you put one, two, and you skip every one. So you do this one, you skip to that one, then you skip down to this one, like a star. It's almost like you're drawing like a five-point star with this. So you do that, and then what you're going to do is you're going to use this. I set it up to 95, and uh, you should learn online. There's probably videos about how to use it. Use one of these, so I'm not going to go into the detail. And I'm just going to go through. I'm just going to do the same thing with the star pattern, and then go once over again just to make sure. And once it, it's going to go, it'll rotate and then click. When you hear that click click, that means you don't go any further. You could still move it, but you're just going beyond the what you said it would do. All right, I'll finish this. So we're gonna put new coolant in, but first we got to uh, do the vacuum on the system down there. Uh, what I did first is actually ran the old fluid through here and just dumped it. And I did that so that way I could clear out this line in case because this is new and if there's any stuff that comes from uh, there. So I have it set up now. I have the airline there. It's set up to about 80 psi. Seven, I think it's about 70. And then I have the air is coming in. The air is coming in here. It's really pump. I have this going out into the bucket just in case I get exhaust. New fluid in here. The fluid hooks up to here. This is off. You turn this on when you have the and you have a fluid after you have a vacuum. This is the pump right here. This is off right now. When I turn it on, it'll start flowing air. And I'll flip it. Okay, so it's uh, ready to go. So I flip this here. So I have the vacuum now. I have to uh, 
do this off and shut it off because I have a limited air supply in it. Otherwise, it would make the sound. So the order of operations for this, they have it hooked up over in here. This is the new coolant coming in. It's hooked up to here. This valve is off initially. Then I have the air coming in here. I set it to 80 PSI. It comes up here through the valve. This is the Venturi uh, valve right here. This is the output. In case uh, the coolant gets in here, I have a dump in the bucket. There should be nothing going through. Initially, this is off and this valve is closed. Right now, I'm halfway through it, so the valve's closed and I already have a vacuum. And then here, I have connected into the coolant tank. I have, I put splicing tape around it and it made it a little bit better seal and also sealed off this. I don't know if that, I think it's like a vent. I think it's a vent and I think it goes down, but not quite to here. So I think I needed to seal it, but I wasn't hundred percent sure. So I, I did it. I don't know if you needs need to be done or not. So this is where the vacuum is, is going to come. And this is also where the new coolant is going to go. So the order of operations is and everything's off. This is going to be closed and this is going to be closed. And what you do 80 PSI in your line, you're going to open up the interior line, open up this line. It's going to blow air through here. That's going to start using your air supply. Once you open here, it's going to start creating the vacuum. If you have a good seal right here, the vacuum will start going up. It'll start indicating that you'll have a vacuum. This will start going up and up and up. And you want to get it right around between the green and the yellow, right around there. And so right there, once that happened, I shut this off and I turned off the valve. So that's where we're at right now. This was shut off and this valve was closed. It means that I'm not using shop air, so that's why I can talk without it going off. All right, so the last thing to do is open up this valve, and the fluid in here will now go into the excavated system. So let's do that real quick, see how it goes. You can see pressure slowly dropping right there. And you can hear what I want to do is I want to make sure this is at the bottom right here. That way I don't run out of fluid. I think I'm okay. So once it goes to zero, it should displace the whole system. There might be a little bit more than needed because it isn't there. However, you know, this is an imperfect system, so there's going to be some leaks. So, all right, it looks like the system's done. And let's see how much I have. All right, it's to the line down there, and that's okay because there's imperfections in the system. Um, and it's also going to have some air on the line here. And I want to see how much I used. Hmm. Let's see, it looks like half the bottle. I'm going to measure it and see how much. Alright, so I successfully completed the first loop and now I'm going to move on to the battery loop itself. And that one, I'm going to have to first drain the radiator. What I have to do is I have to jack this up, remove the wheel cowling, so it's similar to the other process. I'm going to jack up, jack up from this side, remove the wheel, put on the jack stands, and remove the lining. Then I'll be able to access in there. So let me set that up and I'll meet you at that point. Remove the tire, we move the wheel well, we have it on the jack stand right down there. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna disconnect up in here. This is this is the radiator return hose right here that goes to the radiator. It's gonna be on the on this box, it's gonna be the third one. There's one, two, three. So it's the third one, and you're gonna use the quick disconnect. You get a screwdriver underneath here, you're gonna pull down on this. You see, you can kind of see the one up here. It's similar, but it's engaged. So you move this down here, put the box underneath it to my catch in here, and I'm gonna drain it out. So have your bucket ready. All right, so I got the disconnect done over here, and it's the third one. You'll see three pipes, one, two, three. It's the far right or the far forward 
connection for the for the battery loop. And what you have to do is you have to first remove the little metal one. I'll show you on this one here because it's kind of hard to do. And there's a special tool. I didn't have it. So what I used, see if you see some light, is I took, this is part of a plastic bottle. I cut it out, fold the end, and what you have to do is you have to wedge it underneath one of these. And I'm going to show you on the left hand side one because the other one is uh, the one's already disconnected. So what you do is you put it inside there like that except for it goes in it forms a wedge. Let's see if I can do this one handed. So you place them in here and then you push it underneath like that. And once this metal piece is removed, uh, once you slide it in there they'll pull apart. You got to connect it all around 360 because it is all the way around it. You pull it apart and it'll come out and then you can start draining the loop. Uh, once once this starts draining, you go up here, you disconnect it. This thing's going to be blocked by the little block right here. This thing easily pops up. You loosen this up and you start the drain and that gets the first one. The second part of this is we actually have to go underneath the car. So I'm going to jack this up and actually uh, do this. This is the one part of going underneath the car I don't want to do, but I have to. I have to jack this up put on the jack stand. I'll probably put on the secondary jack stand just to be safe over there. And then, because I got two of them, might as well. I have to climb underneath there and I'll do the same thing disconnect on the battery. So I'm going to build a second one of these little temporary uh, catches with the garbage bag and a much lower. Um, so I've just drained the front of the uh, battery coolant loop and what it is right here, this is a quick connect. I don't have the proper tool. This is the one I disconnected here. I told you about to start it. Uh, what I ended up doing is that I ended up removing the, there's a little metal flange. I'll show you on this one. Here's a middle flange. You get a screwdriver in there, you pop it out. Then you have to do is they have a tool. I don't have it. You have to get around in there and you have to extract it out. So what I built instead is I took a piece of plastic, uh, bought, this is like a soda bottle. I took, made a square that would fit around the circumference of it. And I folded one side over, that way I have double sided. And what I did is I wedged it over. I'll show you underneath here. So what I did is I came over from this side, I wedged it around underneath it completely, and then I pushed it forward till it went under. And what that did, it lifted out there's locking legs in here. It lifted those out and I popped it, which, you know, it did make a mess at that time, unfortunately. It did have a little bit of spillage. Most of it was cut in the container, but this is one of the things uh, be careful about. Make sure your container's ready for this. Because this thing, uh, I didn't think I had it in there, but it was in there and then it popped open. So I'm gonna do the same thing, but crawling under the body to do work on that. So uh, on to the next one. All right, since I'm about to crawl underneath here to do the uh, the fluid flush, I'll probably put this on the beginning of the video, though. This is about proper uh, jacking techniques. And if you want to make sure you're doing this right, if you have to crawl underneath the car, because your life's on the line. So essentially, you don't really need to change a tire or you know, have it a, what's called a, a floor jack or something. There's jack points underneath here. You'll see these little cutout spots under there. And you're actually riding the unibody you see the part where it sticks outward and downward, you're going to be writing that on the flat part. So you have that, you raise it with that, actually secure it, and before you want to actually get under it or do anything, if your hands are over here or anything like that, what you want to do is you want to have these set up in this little black area right here, is that you can put your jack stand in there. I'm going to put one on the other side too, because I'm going to crawl underneath here, and that that does, that allows me to little, uh, Makes it a little easier, a little more safe. I'm gonna leave this jack. I'm gonna back it off a little bit, leave it in there just for redundancy. But this is the one that you're relying on right there. And this is what, I'm gonna put this in the front of it. You'll see it throughout the video, of the previous work. I wasn't using the proper techniques 100%, but this is just uh, safety and you should be doing it right. All right, welcome underneath the car. What we're gonna have to do to get to the uh, battery drain plug, or the is we're going to have to first remove the heat shield here. I see that there's four, one, two, three, four, 10 millimeter screws. 
This will get off the heat shield, and this will get us access to the quick disconnect, which we probably have to use the plug for. So I'm going to take these four off, and I'll tell you if I find anything else. Underneath, i just taken off the uh, heat shield, and here's the connector I'm going to remove right here. It's the one that's on the passenger side, so if you're facing backwards on the left-hand side, there's a connector that the coolant loop is going to go through. I disconnect it. I covered up uh, some of this. The connections here. I read a TSB that says it can get corroded if it gets fluid on it, so I just used a shopping bag to go do it. Now, to remove this, uh, it's, uh, one of the guys on the board who's able to uh, tell me what to do. So, kudos to Nick. Yes, I don't want to break this by myself, so we'll see, hopefully see it goes through. So if you see it, there's a... let's see if I can get this over. See, so see it there is this is the connector. This is that connector right there on the left side? See, I don't know if you can see it. There's a little ring in there, the metal wire. So I'm going to pry it from underneath from the, the right hand side, and then I'm going to bring it out and should disconnect. And when I do that, I need to have the uh, need to have the catch underneath me, the tray to do it. So let's see what happens. All right, so get the connector partially off, and uh, to do that. You see there's this little ring I have right here that was on there. I used a flathead screwdriver to go underneath there, move it up, and then it sprung out. Uh, it went upwards. I was able to find it, try not to lose it, and put it away very carefully because you don't want to lose this. When you're done with that, you're going to store it in your spot wherever it is. Make sure you don't lose anything. Then you're going to go back here and you're going to start prying it out. What I did is there's initially a little bit of space right here. And then I put a screwdriver in, flathead, wedged it a little bit, went around because I don't want to swage this thing. So I ended up doing that right there. And I ended up having this connector right here. The point when it comes out, and right at this point, I pull it a little more. Oh. I, pull it, I pull it a tiny bit more. So it's hard to do this one handed, and now it's going out of focus. Yeah. So let's see if I do this one handed. I gotta hold it in place. For the fluid to leak out. This is a solid metal pipe, so it doesn't wanna doesn't wanna do it. So I'm gonna drain this. So here's an optional step I'm doing. Uh, right now it's draining, but because the way my car is set up is a little more forward, what I want to do is I want to tilt the car down. I'm going to pull off the jack, go on the stand, and lower it. Uh, this is dangerous, obviously, because you're on the you're on the uh, scissor lift instead of on the the floor jack. So you want to be very careful doing this and not expose minimize your exposure underneath the car. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower it. That way, it'll face more forward. Let the thing drain out. Put the jack back under, and get back there. Close it. All right, here it is successfully drained. I did lower that down the front a little bit so that way the battery could drain out completely. Raise it back up, might have on the jack stand again. And I'm gonna reconnect it, plug it back in, and then just throw it on that quick disconnect. All right, that connector went on pretty easy. Now I got the quick connect right here alright, coming on pretty easy and there it is and well, now I gotta just do is put back on the heat shield so I forget to replace that replace your heat shield torque it to 9 newton meters alright, now we closed up this, remember, this is the front part we had to close up where it hooks up to the uh, radiator for the battery. So this, you put it over, then you put the connector on. You have to make sure the lip is beyond it, and it'll snap into place. And check by pulling on it, making sure, because next we're going to do uh, the vac and fill. So I have everything set up now to do the vacuum purge and then the vacuum fill. What I ended up doing is I ended up using the splicing tape on here again. This makes it so that the seal's a little better. And I also put it on the exhaust vent right here. 
And what this does is so, so that the vacuum's better and also makes the seal better. This particular brand of splicing tape, I got at Harbor Freight, and it's splicing tape. It looks like electrical tape, but it sticks to itself. This stuff does not like to uh, stick to itself when it gets wet with ethylene glycol. So make sure you just do it with your hands dry and the surface is dry there. So I have the rest set up. I got my shop air right here and it's set up. It's going to go off once I turn, off, turn the air in the line. Uh, what that is, it's set up to here, the Vernelli pump. And I got my pressure gauge, which last time I didn't tell you this, but it, this one particularly, the off, there's a bias on it. It means it's offset by, what is it, about 15 centimeters. I, according to the manual, you want to get 15, uh, 15, I think, inches. So you got to multiply it by 2.54 plus this bias right here. So it should be going to around 50, 60. We were on 55 last time, which explains why the, the first one was a little bit low. It's because we didn't fully evacuate it but luckily it worked okay. So I'm gonna go, the pressure is gonna be a little higher just because of this bias. Now I have this hooked up right. This is on the input. What I end up doing, this is a new one. I end up, the leftover from the other one is about a quarter of it and filling it so it's at the very full brim. This is at the very bottom right here. This way we could have the most come through this loop right here without this wearing out and then have an air in the line. If you're really worried about it, what you should do is you have like a five gallon container like that and just fill it up or a big container that way you don't run out of fluid that's what they do on the official system so we're going to plug this in here this will now form our seal i'm going to turn on the shop air when i turn on the shop air we might hit the point of uh where you're going to hear the uh the compressor go and i won't be able to hear well but i'll try to tell you what i'm doing so we're going to up the air line now So we got air flowing, our gauge is dropping. And we're gonna do, we're gonna turn this on. Now the air should be starting to flow. And I'm gonna turn on, start the vacuum. Vacuum's coming up right now. Pumps engage. Oh, sorry, it's a better view. This is on. Like I hit a button doing this one-handed. So it's filling up right there. Looks like it's a pretty good feel right there. Don't get that much of the system. We still have a little bit of vacuum in there. I probably should have measured this out first before I do this. Let's see if we can uh, pull out some more air and do it again. All right, so now we're at the now we're at the point where we're gonna run the uh, current loop uh, purge test. And what I had to do again is I had to recreate a vacuum over in our tank. And you can see the vacuum over here. I have it already. Um, the difference about this time is that I actually had to drop a little bit out of here. You can see the level's higher though because it's under uh, vacuum right now, but I had to drop it from the initial fill. I had to suck some out, otherwise this is starting to suck fluid. It made a lot of mess right here. So I had to drop that, so that's ready right there. I'm in service mode right now, and this is where you need your battery tender or battery charger at this point right here. And this, otherwise uh, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna end up draining your battery too much. Somebody said the 11 and the 12s were a little different. This is what it is. To get in the service mode, what I had to do is I had to uh, I had to hold down the on button without pressing the brake for five seconds with the key obviously in there. And for five seconds it will go on. Uh, normally if you have the hood up, it'll turn on the engine if you're not in service mode. But in service mode it did that. I have my VCX Nano hooked up right there. And my doing a wireless and it's just given the, following the guides in there. So to get to it from here, VCX Nano is, I'll step you through it, is you go through Module Diagnostics. You go to Hybrid Power Control Module 2. And you go to Control Functions. Then the bleed procedure down there. And you're going to run this thing for 30 minutes. Uh, 
pumps running. And I'm going to hook up this. It's nice having the wireless version of this. So I can hook this up upstairs and uh, keep it powered on. And just, uh, cause I'm going to go do something for 30 minutes. And I just want to show you, we're just about three minutes into the procedure. The initial level when it was under vacuum was here. Now it's dropped to here. And the, the vacuum's down a little bit, which you would expect, as it's probably the air in there was displaced to here. So I got this air a couple minutes into it, and what it means is that my fluid has gone low. It means it's displaced some of the air inside there. So I need to do the fill procedure. Another thing about this in the wireless is that it's dropped out communication with the, uh, the car a couple times, or with the actual the module. So I don't know if, if I would do any module updates remotely. I would probably use the USB doing those. So let's go over here and let's check out this. So, the level is significantly dropped right there, and it's giving me enough air that you need to fill it. So, I got the vacuum in there, so what I'm going to do is, I have this set up here, I'm going to do the vacuum fill, and I'm going to create a vacuum again. But, so I'm going to do that, and it's just the same procedure as we've done. Let's see if I got, got enough air in here, I'll probably make it go off. So, let's just see what's going to happen. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the vacuum a little bit. Let's do that. Alright, that got the pressure up a little bit. Now I'm going to run the fill in here. So I have this here below the water line, or the coolant line. Now let's refill this. And pressure is dropping. Coolant levels going back up. That's a good sign. Now that pressure is down, I am going to do that again. And I'm going to continue the procedure. I've just completed one and a half purge cycles. Uh, halfway through the other one, I accidentally stopped. Uh, so I was planning to do two anyway, so one and a half I think is good enough. Uh, you can see that the level has dropped a little bit more, and I'm just going to go fill that up. What I did uh, partway through is when it was dropping, the pressure would drop, so I would run the, the vacuum of the Venturi line and, and then put the vacuum up a little higher. So that's the last thing I'm going to do is just fill this up. Then I'm going to close off this loop, and the battery loop will be done after this. And then we can move on to the last loop which I've already partially done. Yeah. Oh, there it goes. I think that's the new fill line. There's, I think it's been moved twice. It might be just below the sticker or it might be right below, above that. I'm gonna have to look it up and see. So I'll just adjust that and then close up this loop. Uh, back over on this loop right here, I've already done Probably says, sorry, this is like a Quentin Tarantino style video where everything's going to be chopped up. But I've already done the one over there. And you can do this simultaneously while you're doing the purge on there for the third loop. I did it, I stopped doing it because I wanted to re-level the car. Because unfortunately when my jack stands are on there, this, this side's up a little bit. I wasn't going to crawl underneath with just a uh, floor jack. So that's where I'm at. And the next thing I'm going to go is I'll close this up. And I'll show you that, and then I'll jack this thing up, put on jack stand, and finish the final loop. So, as I showed you earlier, when I was running the purge, disconnected here over at the it's the uh, heater pump right here so that drains out the heater core uh, what you can also do is you can also start draining the radiator and that one's kind of a pain to get to so you're not gonna be able to see it but you go up here and you have to go up 
inside. Uh, you can't see it, but there's the hose right here that we drain the battery with. It goes up around here, and then I'm just above it right here, and you'll see there's a little wedge with like three lines right there. Let's try to get a better picture of it. There is the, uh, it's the heater, uh, heater thermostat right there. And it, what you do is this, you'll feel, you gotta feel for it. There's this little metal piece right here and you're gonna feel the top of it right here. So you feel the little ring right here. You get under there and you pull, I pull on there with the flathead screwdriver and then the thermostat comes out and then it comes gushing out afterwards. And it's really, no really good way about how to clean it that well. Uh, let's see, see if over here in the front, let me get it. Make it a little easier. You can actually see what's going on in there. So here's this is that hose that we changed out earlier in the battery, and it goes in here, and up here is where you're gonna go, and you're gonna see this hose is gonna be up in the way right there, and you just have to go above. There's gonna be three lines right there. I don't know if you can probably can't see it that well. This is probably Sorry, it's the worst thing to get to right here. You can actually, okay, good. You can see where the drain hole is a little bit in there. And it just comes out right there. Is oh, you can see it up there. Sorry, let's see. So that hose right there, this is the front, this is the front air dam is that hose right there is the battery, and it's connected to the quick disconnect that we disconnected. You could disconnect this, remove it, making it easier to access this, and then you can also drain off the last little bit of the uh, little bit of the battery. I was only able to put about four liters out of the battery. I did it by weight. It was just under eight pounds, so or just it was like seven point nine pounds of stuff I pulled out, plus a little bit spilled. So I'm guessing it's just shy of around four, or just or just uh, you know a gallon, about. But you could probably pull out a little bit more if you actually ran your uh, your vacuum or whatever you were getting into up in that. There it is, right there. You have to disconnect that. Um, and then go in there with the uh, with the line, your transfer pump, or your other line, and, and suck out the remainder from where the entrance is, right there to the bottom of the uh, radiator. Now, I, I don't know if there's any. I don't know if you can do that, but that's just a guess, and it might make it easier to get to this. This is going to be a mess here, no matter what. It's raining on my uh, left hand right now. So, uh, the only thing about this, I didn't talk about this too much, is this was kind of a pain to get off, and it took me probably like 15 minutes of going and wedging, going and wedging, going and wedging. I didn't want to rip anything. Uh, this, uh, you gotta go against against the pump here. The pump body casing is not that strong. I felt like if I really yanked on it, I could have broken the, the mounting points on that. So be careful when you're doing that, that one right there. So these are the two points right here. I'm gonna go find where the drain is on the third one and do that. Oh, one last thing about this before I put the pump. I also, I lowered, I lowered the front and I raised the front and it got a little more fluid out. I think it moved the fluid around a little bit. So I think that was helpful there if you want to try to do that. If not, level's the best way of doing it. Unfortunately with these, uh, the jack stands, this is a little raised compared to the rest of it. So that's why I've been using the floor jack. And when I use the floor jack, I don't get underneath here. So sorry, this is a little bit long winded, but this is kind of a pain to do this portion. And don't forget to don't lose your, don't lose your, your uh, retainer plug, and don't forget to put the stuff back together. So, thermostat is opened, and everything's been drained out of there. Also, my second loop over here, which is the heater return. The manual says to do that third, but I did that, I did that earlier when I was doing the battery loop. So those two are drained to the most. 
The third one is you know, it's kind of vague in the instructions, and it tells you to you can use the vacuum, a vacuum pump, which is part of the official uh, tools to use this. Instead of what I'm doing, I'm using a transfer pump, and I'm going. As you can see I removed move the housing from here. Uh, this right here is the intake, this air intake into the uh, air filter box from the front. So you have to remove that, and then what you do is you have a quick disconnect on here. This is the uh, this is one of the the coolant lines coming in to the this one goes to near the bottom of the radiator for the ice and so what they say in the instructions is you what you do is you put down the vacuum the vacuum line in here and you do a vacuum you do a vacuum drain uh, what I am going to do is I'm going to use a transfer pump these are like kind of the cheaper they're a little bit messier because you actually have fluid going through your pump instead of a vacuum where you don't the vacuum pumps are more expensive this one's the cheap solution so what I did is I have the transfer pump from here from Harbor Freight and then I use the, what is, this is a dipstick adapter. Normally it's used for doing, uh, taking fluid out of the dipstick line. I uh, use it on an Audi. And it's really convenient when getting underneath the vehicle. So what I did, I disconnect it here. I use the quick connect. Clean up this area real quick because it's messy. You don't want to add more debris into your coolant loop, especially since you're just cleaning it out. So make sure your line when is clean too. To go in there, since it curves and then goes down, it goes back like this. I have a little curve at the end. I curved it down, rotated it 180 degrees, and then had it go in like this. Uh, rotate 180 and then push it in further, and I'm down near the bottom. I also lowered the left-hand side of the car, or the left-hand forward, so that way I'm thinking that if the radiator is going to be tilted more this way, so I'll get more fluid. Who knows? Maybe not. This process got me about, I'd say about a quart, I'd say like, just maybe a quart, maybe just under a quart of the fluid out. Also, something else I did already is I cleaned, I cleaned this out. I disconnected this. It takes a 10 mil on this end right here. Then there's a plastic tab that you have to pull out with force. It's one of those bristle type tabs. And then you have four of these different connections right here of the hose clamps. I removed it, cleaned it out, put it back. To get to this, I moved the resonator box which because of the sensor right here, I undid, I undid, this is the, uh, what do they call it? The, this is the intake resonator, and it's, so it's got some other stuff in there, probably just a cover, a fancy cover, but it's mostly the intake resonator to uh, dampen the sound. And you have to do it, you have to take a star, it's a Torque 30, two of those right there. I just moved this up, I didn't remove the whole system. That just made this move a little more easily and made this easier to get out to clean. So I did that, Look out here. I'm gonna to try to attempt to find to find and see if it's really accessible. It's gonna be the uh, internal the ice uh, pump in here for the coolant pump. It's got a little reservoir, and instructions tell you to do a, to do that. I'm gonna see. I think I have to access from underneath there. It might be too much of a pain, so I might just leave it alone. Uh, the instructions uh, are telling you to drain it, but it shows it fully like exposed, so you might not be able to access that. So I'm gonna to try to do that next, and just showing you what the transfer pump is. The transfer pump went in there and then I had it drained out here. I drained some earlier. This is from the second, from lowering it to the corner. So it looks like that actually did a little more. So I'm probably sitting about a quart. So we'll see what happens next. So I decided not to do the reservoir drain up in the pump area, just simply because if I do it, I can get to it, but it's just gonna get fluid everywhere and it probably would cause more corrosion than good it would do probably damage another system uh, so if you're taking it out that's the only time to do it so it's actually if you want to do it though it's uh up in here it's blocked by the, these pipes right here there's cool pipes you have a flywheel and then above it there's a let me see if i can get a better view in here problem is the lights out of the way so you can see it's all right so you're not gonna be able to good yeah you're not gonna get a good view here but essentially you have uh, let's see uh, I can't get you maybe okay here's probably the best view fortunately this is like the best view you're gonna get so behind that Right here, this is the mounting bracket for the, the vehicle. Uh, it's an engine to the vehicle, so it's the engine mount and one of them. So right behind it and underneath here, you actually have the uh, drain right there. 
So you can actually go up there, you can feel it, you can feel the hex bolt. If you wanted to, you can drain it. Uh, procedure says you're supposed to un you're supposed to replace the crush washer or the, the fix washer in there. I think if I do this, it's going to get the coolant over here. It'll probably cause more corrosion and probably lead to more, you know, more issues than it's worth for that for that quart or probably less than a quart because I've gotten about five out now. So I think that's good enough for the system for this. For this, so the, the fluid doesn't look bad, so I'm going to call the draining good, and I'm going to proceed on to the uh, next the next stage. The only other thing that would be nice if if I could command the GDS2 to open up the, uh, the it's a thermostat. Usually, normally there's a a thermostat to or a thermostat like a heat coupler that keeps your engines warms the engine internally before it it calls on uh, fluid from the outside. It looks like this one is uh, I don't know if it's mechanical. It's got Looks like it's a solenoid driven, so it might be it might be commanded open, commanded close. Uh, that would get a little bit more out, and that's when I was uh, draining out the front side. So I'm not really sure if that's gonna would add a whole lot, or it's probably not worth it. So law of diminishing returns. I'm gonna skip this one, and I'm gonna go to the vacuum fill, the vacuum fill, and it requires some uh, GDS2 commands. All right, so I have it set up now to do the vac and fill. And I have right here, I have this, it's full of new Dex fluid. It's hooked up to there. I have my Venturi line, my line set up to my pressure. And I have, in this case over there, I have it plugged in. It holds a vacuum without the tape on this one, or the splicey tape, unlike the other two. So I didn't use it on this one. I closed all the three things that I've opened which is right down there, so I could drain the last out of the, uh, of the radiator. I cleaned out the uh, radiator, the temperature the thermo thermostat, and then also on the heat pump, I cleared out those. So the first thing I have to do, and I have the car, I have it hooked up to a charger, and I'm also running in service mode, where it's, you hold it down without pressing the brake on, five seconds, turns on service mode, which allows me to talk to the... We're going to go into Module Diagnostics. Then we're going to go to Hybrid Powertrain Control Module 2. And then we're going to go to Control Functions. And then we're going to do is the pasture compartment heating heater coolant control solenoid valve. So we're going to communicate to that. And we have a command state on the bottom. We have to command it to normal mode. So we command it, and we can see our value is going up right there. Now we go, once that's on, it means that it's now has an open the valve, so that way we can vacuum it. We're gonna do the vacuum procedure over here, which you've seen done several times. So, I'm gonna put up my line. Put up line pressure, turn it on. And now, here we go. For this and since I've got the line this is collapsed in there now I'm going to do the fill and open the valve what I want to do is I don't want to fill everything because I don't want to create air on this line I want to still keep a vacuum so start the first remember this is off we use the one down here and we're going to do this twice now, there it goes in there And if I see, if that line starts to come out right there, if I see anything loose, that means I need to immediately shut this off. That way I don't lose the vacuum in there. So my vacuum's coming down. 
Remember, I got the bias on this one, so yours might have, if it's a cheaper one like this one, it might have some bias, it might not. So, I'm starting to see fluid inside the reservoir, which is good. And it looks like it's still slowly coming up. The pressure's dropping. I'm gonna actually do it again. Uh, one thing about this though, if you have this right here, and if you have this right here, at least in this cheap one, when I shut off this valve and turn this on, it gets this right everywhere. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick the exhaust inside there. That way, as previously was getting everywhere else. So, let's do that. We can avoid getting it nasty. All right, I'll turn on this. It's gonna get loud again. So I finished it the second time. On the second time, this was below the, the fill line. So this ended up sucking, sucking it back and that's what made it come out the vent and the port. So if this is below your coolant level, you don't wanna run this. You're probably good with this, the one. I have instructions say is that now I'm gonna fill it up, which I just did to add it to the level. And then I'm gonna run a command for two minutes and According to it, it says this is the, we need to do the auxiliary coolant pump for two minutes. And you're gonna go under a miscellaneous test and auxiliary coolant pump. And then we're gonna command it on for two minutes. You can hear it right there going. So wait two minutes and turn it back off. So during the first two minute initial, you can hear kind of a gurgling sound in the background. And that means is there air in there? That's what air sounds like. That's uh, triggered flow right there. It sounds kind of like the waterfall or just like bubbles in there. So it's some, but not all of it. So after two minutes, we'll shut off and continue. All right, two minutes have passed. Now we're gonna turn off the pump and we're gonna start up the engine. Uh, what we have to do is we have to heat up the, uh, heat up and open up the thermostat in the body. So we're gonna do it how we normally would, and that's just waking up. You gotta make sure you're clear, your engine bay is cleared, and you're powered up. We're gonna run the engine. And we gotta heat it up. We're gonna go into the engine control module. Here. So, display data. We're gonna look at, maybe it's in the engine data. Let's see what's. Engine coolant temperature. What you wanna do is make sure we're in Celsius. All right, well what happened right here, it got up to about 91 Celsius. Now it started dropping a little bit. It's probably an indication that your, uh, the valve is open up. It's the mechanical valve. 
You see it's dropping a little bit. That's a good indication of it. I'm gonna let it heat up a little more. Now it's starting to go back up. So that dip means now that the system's flowing through and it's, get, it's getting a little bit cooler coolant into the, the system. So I'm gonna let it go up a little bit more and that just gives me a little bit of uh, time in between so the valve will still be open when I shut off the engine. So if I shut it off now, what it would do is that it would more quickly do it. Uh, more quickly would sh shut off the uh, mechanical valve. And so I'm gonna let it go up a little more. All right, I know I hit temperature, so I'm gonna shut off the engine. And then I'm gonna put it back in service mode. Five seconds. Let's close that. I'm gonna run that valve for one minute again. Uh, get to that valve. HVAC control module, control functions, it's miscellaneous tests, auxiliary coolant pump, and then you run it for one minute. So, you're going to run it for one minute, and then you're going to shut it off, wait five minutes, and you're going to turn the engine on, wait for it to heat up. Once it reaches temperature, shut it down, run the pump a minute. And so it's gonna be a total of three, of the, that's a second cycle. There's gonna be three of these cycles total. After that, you wait for it to cool down and then you fill for, you add the fill up to whatever you're missing there and then you'll be done. So just a little fun fact. Uh, I don't think enabling or clearing that code let me do the engine control, the throttle body position sensor. It uh, looks like it's disabled when the engine's running. Uh, I don't know, probably for other diagnostics, but not something you can do. If you press down the gas, it'll only go to 2,000 RPM. So that's how you do it. You go when you step on the gas on the inside. So it's bit just easier just to do it, wait inside here, uh, let the temperature warm up, and then do that procedure. That is the charger loop. It'll. I'm sorry. The. Uh, oh, there goes the. Thing. <laughs>